name is Karen Hill. I'm in Montreal, and today is the 8th of June, 1984. This is the Oral History of Social Work in Canada project, a project of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Today I'm interviewing Mr. Manuel Batshaw, who's had long experience in uh, social work in both the United States and Canada. Mr. Batshaw, in order to get started, I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about uh, when and where you were born, and uh, a little bit about your background. Well, I'm a Montrealer. I was born uh, on April 17, 1915, which makes me 69 years of age. And um, I have uh, lived in Canada for uh, most of my life, though I did spend some 23 years in the United States as part of my professional career. The uh, general subject of how uh, I got into the career is something that uh, we can talk about if that's what you'd like to do. Very much. I'd very much like to hear that. I uh, happen to be among those who uh, believe that uh, most people uh, don't select a career, but in many ways through uh, both the inheritance and the environment, a career is almost thrust upon them. Uh, when I graduated from the School of Social Work, my thesis was on the subject of how people select a career. And uh, I found to my surprise that it wasn't so much the parents who had the influence but uh, if I recall correctly, it was the um, teacher, the professor, the um, sibling, uh, particularly a peer person or persons, and then the family. Uh, and I would like to believe that my own career would illustrate that as well because uh, I came from a family of immigrant parents who came here from Russia around 1902. And uh, my father worked as a carpenter at the Canadian National Railroad. And my mother ran a grocery store, the back of which is where we resided for many years. And uh, what I recall with a great deal of uh, nostalgia now and interest is that uh, despite the fact that my parents were of very humble financial circumstances, worked very hard and very long hours, that there was a tradition in the home uh, towards both philanthropy and towards volunteer service. Uh, we had in our uh, kitchen uh, some six or seven little charity boxes that were attached uh, to the wall. And the uh, practice on Friday night, which is the beginning of our Sabbath, was for each of the children to deposit uh, into the, each of these charity boxes for various charitable causes a penny or a coin, uh, and uh, periodically uh, collectors would come around and would empty the coin boxes. At the same time, uh, I can recall vividly that uh, my mother uh, always took time off to work for an organization called then the Hebrew Consumptive Aid Association because tuberculosis was a very serious problem. And this is a, a woman who could hardly speak English. Um, while well, she was educated in Jewish, in Yiddish, uh, English was not her mother language. And uh, despite it all, uh, she found time to go to meetings, to uh, make sure that she raised funds through tag days. Uh, she made sure that we as children would um, also participate in selling tags in order to raise funds. 
And it was that whole kind of uh, background uh, that uh, I was fortunate to have been brought up in. And uh, this had an influence uh, on my uh, parents, uh, that is my parents' influence, uh, but also on other members of my family. So that uh, my father, for example, uh, was very active as a socialist uh, in wanting to work towards a better world and uh, work together with others uh, in Montreal in an organization called the Workmen's Circle. And uh, their object was twofold. One was to work uh, for human rights and uh, basic uh, benefits that were needed by people in terms of uh, decent standard of living. And uh, the other was a mutual benefit association where they provide, were provided, uh, well, that's where they provided their members with um, health uh, services, uh, with welfare services, uh, and uh, had the kind of almost Medicare and uh, private social welfare network uh, that we have in, on, of course, a much smaller scale. Uh, then my brother, uh, who uh, was the senior member of the family, uh, became very interested in the uh, cause of Jewish people who were refugees. And um, so he became very keen about Israel and Zionism with a view to making sure that uh, any Jew anywhere in the world who uh, was not comfortable in uh, the particular setting in which he lived would have the freedom to go to a country which would be a Jewish national home mm -hmm. and uh, thereby uh, not suffer the discriminations that he would normally suffer. Excuse me, Mr. Bashel, can we stop for just sure. a second? Okay, when we, when we uh, stopped there for a minute, Mr. Bashel, you were talking about uh, your brother and his interest in uh, Israel and Zionism and its influence on you? Yes. and. The, the point, I think, in talking about my mother, my father, my brother, uh, is simply to illustrate that uh, if one is nourished with this kind of background, then whether it, one inherits uh, this interest in people and this desire to be of service, or whether one acquires it through environment, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, these are very important influences uh, on one's life. And uh, I would tend to feel that uh, my entire life has been, both personal and professional, uh, has been influenced by this concept that uh, we are here on Earth to um, be useful and uh, to justify one's existence, and not in terms of what one literally takes out of life, though that obviously is one of the motivations, but even more important, uh, even though it may sound uh, somewhat uh, puerile to say uh, really what we, we give to life and mm -hmm. what we contribute to it. And uh, I think that that perhaps explains uh, how I, I came to social work because uh, in my uh, early days as a youngster, as a teenager, uh, again I was influenced by the fact that my brother had been a counselor at a charity camp for children. Uh, I had great admiration for my brother and um, I guess uh, it was a goal for myself as well. and. Uh, I recall that about the age of 14 or 15, I became a counselor in the same camp that he had been a counselor some 10 or 15 years before that. Uh, following uh, that, uh, worked with young people uh, 
uh, I became very uh, active in an organization called Young Judea. Again, it was an influence of my brother in that this was a youth organization to help establish the State of Israel as a Jewish home. And um, following that, uh, I became very interested in the Young Men's Hebrew Association, which was really a group work agency. And uh, having first having started as a member, and then as a club leader, and then as a supervisor of club leaders, and then as the educational director, and then the supervisor of group work activities. All of this, as you can see, is uh, a sort of natural uh, growth uh, of a uh, pattern which was established from very early days and just uh, extended itself uh, throughout the entire career. Mm -hmm. you, you were mentioning that um, during the time that you were at the agency, the Young... Young Judea? Uh, the young Men's Hebrew Association. Young Men's Hebrew Association, that you carried on a number of positions. Were those paid positions? Yes, they were all paid positions. They were mostly part-time while I was going to university. And mm -hmm. then uh, at the point that I became the educational director, that was a full-time position, and the director of group work services. Was this during the time of the Depression? This was during the time of the Depression, yes. And the YMHA I would say it's, it was located on the corner of Mount Royal and Park Avenue in Montreal. Uh, it probably had as its most import important activity uh, that of an employment office because of the Depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also was the place where so many unemployed people came to spend their time because of the uh, ravages of unemployment at that time. Mm -hmm. Did the Depression uh, have an effect on your decision to go into social work as well? I think I would have gone in anyway. Uh, I think it was simply uh, perhaps an emphasis uh, that uh, it had for me. But uh, the period of uh, the Depression probably did not affect the Jewish community quite as severely as it did the general population. I would attribute that partly to the fact that uh, the Jewish population was more highly educated and therefore had a tendency to uh, uh, be employed in areas that were not quite as hit, as hardly hit, as uh, people working in factories or in other types of uh, menial employment. Uh, nevertheless, there was a significantly large uh, Jewish population of young men and young women who uh, were unemployed. Uh, the interesting thing uh, from a social work uh, community organization standpoint was that one of our very important uh, agencies in this community and communities throughout North America is the Jewish Vocational Service, and it actually had its birth uh, from the employment office of the YMHA, mm -hmm. uh, and in that way has now developed uh, to much more than a placement agency, but actually a career development organization. Mm -hmm. And were you involved in the beginning of that service uh, at YMHA? Not really. Uh, at that point, I think I was quite young, and uh, that service actually was conducted by uh, non-professionals. Uh, I recall the secretary to the executive director of the YMHA was the chief employment officer, mm -hmm. and yet her background was one of having a good heart, being very sympathetic and patient, but really no particular skills in, in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is a very highly developed professional um, uh, activity mm -hmm. and service. Um, you decided to uh, get some formal social work training in the mid-30s. How did it happen that you chose McGill? It was a combination of things, but again, I guess a natural development. Uh, I resided in Montreal uh, 
and uh, having worked at the YMHA for uh, a number of years as a part-time person and having decided that I was going to pursue a uh, career in social work on a professional basis, uh, I realized I needed training and uh, McGill provided me, or that is, it was then called the Montreal School of Social Work. Uh, it was an interesting story about its relationship to McGill, but at that time it was independent uh, and uh, it was on the McGill campus, but uh, occupying uh, a building that was really used for the ROTC. And um, the first task that we had each morning was to remove the beer cans and beer bottles uh, <laughs> to prepare the room for as a classroom. Uh, and uh, it provided me with the opportunity of continuing to work at the YMHA on a part-time basis while at the same time going to school. And uh, so it was a, a natural uh, thing for me to do, uh, to uh, go to school because at, in Montreal because it gave me the combination of being able to work and earn a livelihood while at the same time going to school. I had also gone to um, uh, Western Reserve in Cleveland for a summer and uh, worked there, uh, studied there under Grace Coyle and Neustetter. And um, that was really, I, I think, a very, very stimulating experience. Mm -hmm. And if anything, uh, while there was no doubt about the fact that I was going to pursue uh, a career in social work, uh, it uh, reinforced it so that my coming back from Cleveland to Montreal was to move into the most logical sequence for me to follow. Mm -hmm. Do you have a recollection about the courses that you had while you were at uh, the Montreal School? <coughs> yes. Uh, interestingly enough, I think you'd find the curriculum was not terribly different. Uh, you know, the reading material would perhaps be somewhat different and we had less texts available, but um, in general the uh, emphasis was on uh, family and child welfare. And uh, casework was uh, then taught, uh, and I'm now talking about 1938, uh, in, in ways which I don't see uh, significant uh, differences today except for perhaps a, a more psychoanalytic approach that may be used today. But uh, in general there was a, a remarkable, I think, understanding of uh, principles, uh, philosophy, theory. Uh, one of the uh, big issues I, re I recall, which I think illustrates the understanding, was the question of whether a person who was unemployed, this again was during the Depression, uh, should be allowed to own his own car. Uh, should they be allowed to have their own bank account? Or were they supposed to sell their car? Or use up their last penny before they would be eligible for relief or either public or private welfare. And uh, to the credit, I think, of the social work community, uh, there was a very strong position of understanding the dignity of the individual and the importance of supporting it rather than destroying it and uh, there was a general acceptance that we had to do everything we possibly could to try and 
and strengthen and, and, uh, and build the sense of uh, self-worth and confidence of the individual. And there was a whole area of trying to help the individual understand himself. And um, I recall so vividly uh, uh, working in casework shortly after I graduated from school at the Baron de Hirsch Institute. I worked with uh, men who were unattached, not married or widowers, uh, who had problems. And this man had had a long psychological problem as a, I guess if you wanted to describe him generically, you'd say as a neurotic, but a severe one. And uh, his whole attitude was one of projecting the blame on society or on his family, and in this case on me, the social worker. And, uh, one occasion, uh, he was so angry with himself, but projecting it on me, he raised uh, a chair and, and threw it. Uh, and it caused uh, quite consternation because uh, uh, there was a uh, door with a large window next to my desk, and the, the chair went through that window. Uh, you can imagine all the excitement in the office. I don't think he intended to hit me because with it because he was as close to me as you are and uh, he'd have to be blind not to be able to hit me. But I think this was a way of you know, expressing his, his anxiety and his, uh, his anger. And uh, well, you know, our understanding of his behavior, and this is in the 30s, I think if that same man came to me today, uh, I'm not sure that uh, I would have handled him any differently than I did or, or have perhaps had different understanding about him. Mm -hmm. So I'm illustrating this only to indicate that, uh, strange as it may seem, that in the 30s, uh, I think that our uh, courses and our understanding in social work uh, was uh, fairly mature. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be, uh, I suppose, if anything, it's a reflection on the fact that we haven't moved maybe terribly far <laughs> from that time. But uh, I, I'd rather give credit to the early days and the understanding that did exist at that time. Mm -hmm. Did you have courses in uh, what we now call community organization? Yes. Uh, Although, I guess if there is, is a difference, the uh, courses were much more focused on uh, casework. Um, I actually was in, in the fie a field work placement uh, in casework, but was working in a group work agency. And so much of the material that I prepared in terms of papers uh, was related to the work I was doing in group work. Group work at that time, and we're talking again in the late 30s, um, was a uh, much newer uh, division in our profession. Uh, Grace Coyle was perhaps uh, one of the uh, originators with Neustetter. Uh, and uh, there too, I, I I was really amazed at that time that uh, there was, in a relatively short period of time, I'm thinking of perhaps oh, less than 10 years, a body of knowledge about group work that had uh, developed. Uh, now, community organization followed group work. So as I saw it, uh, in terms of development, it was the casework emphasis and then the uh, group work and then community organization. But at that time, at least in the late 30s and early 40s, uh, I don't know that we, if I recall correctly, uh, emphasized the differences 
In other words, we saw social work in more generic terms. And uh, then, as you probably are familiar, uh, we went through a stage where uh, uh, we began to specialize in casework, in group work, in CO. Uh, and now I see the wheel turning uh, where we seem to be again thinking of it more generically. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think most of us believe that uh, whether you're doing casework or group work, uh, social work is really what it, it's all about in terms of being concerned with our society. And so if you're a caseworker, you are doing community organization, uh, even though you may be doing it uh, most of the time with an individual, but you're also working with a committee usually uh, and with an agency, and the agency is concerned. Uh, so that um, I, for myself, am uh, inclined to feel that uh, the emphasis on the specialization in social work, uh, while I think it's desirable, it, it's not as important as seeing social work in its totality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting comment. Given the, given the interest in, in specialization and uh, relates to standards of practice and, and uh, regulation and that sort of thing, I'm, I'm thinking back to what you mentioned earlier about the interest of your father and the the activity, the involvement of your father in um, political types of action. And I understand that during the '30s in Montreal, there were a number of uh, pretty significant developments for Canada. The, League for Social Reconstruction, for example, was one of the things which had its roots here in Montreal. Were you at all affected by or involved in those kinds of Canadian developments? Not really. Uh, I think uh, in my, again, you know, you have to think of my uh, age at that particular time. Uh, I was relatively young. And then I was in the Army. And, um, and then went off to the United States, so that I, I wasn't quite as immersed uh, mm -hmm. in these areas. <clears throat> okay, and that final question that I would ask you about that period when you were in school was uh, your um, affiliation with the professional association. Right. Uh, again, I, I was rather fortunate in that uh, I was always active uh, in the Montreal branch of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Uh, when I came out of the war and was discharged, uh, I was elected the president of the Montreal branch and uh, unfortunately was only able to serve in that capacity for a few months because then I moved to Philadelphia where I took on a major group work position there. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I wasn't quite as uh, active uh, in the association after that because then I was away for some 23 years. But in the United States, I uh, also was active in the association there. We called it uh, the National Association of Jewish Center Workers. Uh, center workers really were group workers. And uh, I was the uh, president of the New Jersey chapter, and then I became the national president of the association. Mm -hmm. And of course we were very active uh, with the uh, NASW at that time. In fact, we went through, uh, I don't know whether this is of interest to you, but we went through another uh, interesting period uh, in terms of the struggle of the Jewish social worker uh, in terms of whether his uh, identification with the profession should be a universal one uh, or and a, uh, a sectarian one. In other words, uh, working in the United States, should I be an active member and leader of the National Association of Social Workers, or should I put my energies into the uh, 
National Association of Jewish Center Workers. And uh, this reflected, I think, uh, many of the uh, concerns and development of many Jewish people as to whether they were uh, identifying as Jews or whether they were identifying as, uh, quote, uh, citizens generally mm -hmm. in the profession. And uh, we had uh, problems in that uh, many of our members, when the NASW developed, uh, decided to throw all their energies into that uh, area, uh, thus decimating the uh, efforts and resources in the Jewish group. And uh, subsequently, uh, let's say 10, 15 years later, it reversed itself. Uh, and uh, so it reached, I guess, a happy balance where people feel uh, very comfortable about making their contribution universally through the National Association, at the same time feeling it's no less important uh, to make their contribution within the sectarian group. Mm-hmm. Okay. Turn this over. <clears throat> that issue um, in the United States, has, it, has, that, um, has that come up in Canada? No. It hasn't been a, a problem in Canada. First of all, the numbers of Jewish social workers uh, are relatively limited in number. And uh, in the case of Jewish center workers, uh, we're talking about YMHAs, there are only two or three of them in all of Canada. So that that wasn't uh, an issue. Other than that uh, Canadian social workers did belong to uh, sectarian social work organizations in the United States. So that for the most part, these were North American organizations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That had been the case earlier on, too, in, in the 20s, I understand, before there was the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Right. Many people would belong to the NASW in the States. Um, I'm interested in, in talking more about what was happening in the States at the time, and I don't know whether you want to go chronologically, because That's if you right. do, we have to go back to the war, yeah. or else we can go, go forward uh, into the United States. Uh, perhaps we could switch back uh, to the end of your time at McGill, and uh, you could tell us what happened at, when you finished your, your course at McGill. At the Mon right. It wasn't at McGill, was it? It was at the Montreal School Montreal of Social Work. Montreal School of Social Work, that's yeah. right. Although it became the McGill School of Social Work, I think, the year after I graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I graduated in 1938, and I think it became the McGill School in 39 or 40, if I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, I. Uh, as my first position uh, after graduating, uh, I became a caseworker. Uh, that is, I should say, I was a social worker doing casework uh, at the Baron de Hirsch Institute. And uh, that's where I worked with single unattached men. In fact, uh, I guess all aspects of my life seem to have a natural uh, sequence in that. Uh, I uh, used to bring these unattached men to the Jewish General Hospital clinic uh, for uh, various kinds of uh, physical and neurological, at that time it wasn't described as psych psychiatric, but they were described it as neurological um, treatment. And uh, the, social, the medical social worker at the time was uh, a lady by the name of Rachel Levitt. And she used to look after the uh, men who I would bring. And uh, in consequence of that, we married. <laughs> and uh, so uh, my uh, marriage is really a reflection of my uh, experience in social work as well. <laughs> and uh, after uh, doing that, uh, I uh, then took on a uh, position as uh, the National Field Director of Canadian Young Judea, uh, 
Uh, this was during a period when I was waiting to enter the army. And uh, in this position, I uh, went uh, throughout Canada and organized youth groups uh, which were interested in the well-being of establishing a, a state in Israel. Uh, again, this is an effect and influence of my brother's uh, experience in the earlier days. And, uh, and then uh, I volunteered to uh, enter the army, uh, the Canadian army. Uh, the uh, war had, uh, I think, been in progress for uh, a couple of years. And uh, I entered, I think it was in, uh, I enlisted uh, in 1942 at the age of 28. And uh, while I was qualified at that time as a social worker, uh, the feeling was that uh, any uh, individual who was to become an officer uh, really should have had overseas service. Um, and I guess in some ways they were reserving positions for people who had been wounded overseas and officers who had been wounded and would come back and there would be the problem of what to do with them. And so uh, the uh, effort was to try to find jobs for them on this side. So there was a reluctance to uh, consider me as an officer or, or as a candidate to become an officer. So I became a private in the infantry, and uh, I, I guess the most vivid experience there is uh, the uh, discipline of having to uh, first work for hours and hours, if not days, on very oily boots that you were supplied with to try to get them to shine, and they had to shine in order to satisfy your sergeant. and. Uh, that you no sooner had them shining after a few days of effort, then he would march you into a trench where they would all get muddy again. And so I would just go back to shining. Well, this was kind of the content and value of, uh, of my early experiences in the Army. Uh, then uh, there was a uh, need in the personnel selection department. There was no social work at the time, but there was a personnel selection department which uh, administered questionnaires and tests uh, to all recruits, and it was to help determine where they might be placed and how they might be used in the Army. And these were better than one would have expected. And uh, at one point, they required somebody at the depot to help in typing up the results of these tests. And uh, they had a call out for typists. And I was one of these fetch and fetch, uh, typists. And um, so uh, I volunteered because I was very anxious to get into this department. And fortunately, was able to move from there to actually administering the tests, and uh, then was promoted from private to sergeant, and then staff sergeant. And uh, around, um, when was it? Uh, after I had been in the Army for about a year or two, um, I guess it was about a year, uh, the decision was made to uh, establish a social service department. And this is where Stuart Sutton became the head of it. And uh, rather than, as in the United States, having the Red Cross, concern themselves with the families of uh, and dependents of 
uh, military personnel, uh, the Canadian Army decided to establish a social service organization as part of the medical corps. And uh, I was invited at that time to uh, become a social worker to set up the program in the province of Quebec, for the entire area outside of Quebec City itself. And I think I did this uh, as a second lieutenant um, I smile because there's a personal st story attached to that too, but maybe we don't need to take the time for it. But uh, the story is related to the fact that uh, uh, one uh, could not become an officer at that time because, again, of the large numbers of officers coming back from overseas, and one could not become an officer unless one had had overseas experience and, uh, and therefore anybody who had a cat medical category of one which meant that you were healthy uh, was not eligible to be an officer uh, other than an officer for uh, active service overseas but you couldn't be uh, an officer in a, uh, a service that uh, was a non-combatant service. <clears throat> what kind of a position would that place a person like you in then when you're trying to set up some a new organization and you don't have the rank to... Uh... Well that was the problem and uh, the, there was a recognition that uh, I had to ha be an officer. On the other hand there was the problem of the policy that I was a uh, number one category and uh, therefore was eligible for military service overseas. Uh, whereupon they sent me for a, uh, a medical uh, reclassification. And uh, the only thing they could find wrong with me and the only complaint I had was that I had a hallux valgus, which is like a big bunion on one of my feet. And when the uh, medical officer asked me how that uh, disabled me. I explained that when I was standing for long hours at pay, uh, during the pay patrol, uh, that uh, my, my feet pained me. Uh, whereupon he said, well now I really can't uh, change you. And, uh, and I said, well look, I'd be very happy to go overseas because uh, at that point I was ready. And uh, he said, uh, well, I could either leave it as a one or give you uh, a four and discharge you. Because if you can't walk, you can't uh, actually keep you in the army. So I said, well, leave it as a one. And uh, so then he changed it to a three. <laughs> and the three made me eligible to become an officer in a non-combatant. <laughs> so these are circumstances that, that develop but uh, we then developed the uh, uh, social work service, which uh, I, I must say uh, was probably uh, uh, one of the outstanding ones in the world. Uh, certainly far better than anything they did in the United States. And Stuart and others deserve the credit for it. Uh, we were able to uh, mobilize all of the private and public resources in the community so that uh, any soldier who had a family problem uh, would be able to uh, make it known to his officer whether he was overseas or in Canada and uh, it would be communicated to us and we had a group of social workers and public health nurses and on our staff. I have pictures of them here. And um, we were able, within a very short time, to be able to get a message back uh, to the officer of that particular soldier as to what the circumstances were.
and what we were doing about it, and uh, or if the situation was serious enough, uh, and we felt it was important for him to be home, that uh, he would be brought home. And we had uh, just the highest authority uh, in our work, in that any recommendation we made was tantamount to being a recommendation made by the uh, head medical officer mm -hmm. uh, in the Army. And uh, consequently, we had a lot of credibility and a lot of cooperation, and uh, it worked very effectively. We had uh, many situations where uh, large numbers of soldiers were uh, about to be uh, transferred overseas, uh, many of whom were not only frightened for their own sake, but, but particularly concerned about what would happen to their young families, and they were all young families. And uh, we met with every one of these people, uh, gave them a lot of time. Uh, I think the mere fact that they had these kinds of interviews uh, with interested, uh, concerned people and had the assurance that if anything was needed that the family would be taken care of uh, was one way that we were able to, I think, make it possible for a lot of these soldiers to go overseas who might not otherwise have been able to. And in some cases also we were able to uh, prevent some from going overseas because they would have become casualties uh, for fear and for anxieties about their families and so on. So that social work was much more than a helping profession in the Army. In my judgment, it, it really was uh, an integral part of um, selecting uh, the right people to go overseas. And at the same time, it was um, uh, an instrument for uh, uh, mobilizing the entire community in behalf of the war effort. Mm -hmm. <coughs> The uh, Dependence Board of Trustees, uh, which was centered in Ottawa, also had involvement with the families That's of right. military people. How did the two work together, military social work and the Dependence Board of Trustees? The uh, way that developed was that uh, there were resources required which private agencies could not necessarily provide. Uh, Relief, for example, was one of the major uh, requirements. Uh, health services for family. We didn't have Medicare. We didn't have the kinds of services we have here. And uh, so the uh, Dependence Association was, be, was able to really provide these resources, which, which we used. Uh, I remember uh, Gladys Fulford, I don't know whether you remember her at all, but she headed it. And uh, her office in Montreal was uh, almost an adjunct of ours. It was just that close a relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in some ways, that war period, I think, was, was sometimes other thing other types of activity are described as the finest hour in social work because of the fact that um, there just wasn't any kind of uh, bickering or competitiveness or uh, uh, bureaucracy because whether it was uh, public or private and, or military uh, I suppose one expects that during a time of emergency where everybody uh, unites. But we did have a very, very successful experience. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I have, uh, if you're interested at this point or any point, I have a, a number of paragraphs which describe that whole period mm -hmm. of um, social work in the Army. Um, one of the things that we could do is after the interview is over, um, I can use the videotape 
to take pictures of that, okay. to take pictures of the photographs that you have okay. and things like that. So we could do that all at once at the end. Fine. That would be okay. Mm -hmm. um, during that period um, in which you were involved in social work for the Canadian Army, what were some of the uh, some of the difficulties that you faced in that period? I think for Quebec, uh, the major problem was that the French-speaking services were not nearly as well developed as the Anglophone services. And uh, therefore, the uh, resources that were available were relatively limited. So that uh, I would say today we have many more resources. I'm trying to think of what uh, some of the other limitations were. Frankly, I, I don't mm -hmm. recall. I'm sure they existed. One of the one of the comments that I heard uh, quite recently was that um, this was from an uh, an English uh, Ontario resident who had grown up under the impression that there were no French Canadians in the Second World War at all, until he went to uh, the beachhead of Normandy mm -hmm. recently and saw Dieppe, the graves of Dieppe and saw, saw the headstones with all the French Canadian names. Sure. To what extent were you, as a social worker, seeing, um, dealing with the French Canadians who you know, English Canada thinks didn't participate in the Second World War. You were here. What what happened from your point of view? Uh, I may, you know, at this point have a kind of romanticized the view of things because uh, of the period of time that's passed. But uh, again, I don't recall, other than you know, some newspaper articles and. Um, that that this was a really severe problem. Uh, certainly it, it was not a problem that I can recall uh, within the army itself. I think that it may have been a political problem outside uh, the army, but uh, within it, uh, if you're f faced with the situation as they are uh, where your life is involved. There is a, a tremendous motivation for people to work together. Uh, in my case, even in uh, in Canada, uh, here I was uh, an Anglophone, a Jewish person, and uh, dealing, I would say, largely with French-speaking personnel. Now. Uh, that was never a problem for me or for the personnel. My uh, staff of social workers were, uh, I think, uh, all, all French-speaking. Um, and yet, uh, you know, we worked together with the greatest of harmony. So, uh, I would tend to differentiate between the um, political problem in society, and I think part of that had to do with the beginning of nationalism here, and uh, which ended up with the PQ and so on. And there was at that time, I think, the Saint Jean Baptist uh, Society, which was a very uh, rabid nationalistic organization. But uh, I would say that. That was a, an outside influence, but I did not feel that it uh, reflected itself in the internal operations within the army or within the society of, of soldiers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that might be a good uh, stopping place, um, unless there are other comments that you'd like to make about uh, 
your time in the military as a social worker? No, I think that's that's sufficient. Uh, if I you want to just uh, have one additional thought that occurs to me now, and that is that uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, took up the work or took on the work of the social service department uh, in the army so that uh, those soldiers who were coming back as veterans uh, who required service, uh, whose families required service, uh, went to the Department of Veterans Affairs for it. Hmm. And uh, I was invited at that point, uh, at the point of my discharge, to head up a similar effort uh, in the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs in Montreal to continue the service that uh, we had provided in the Army. Uh, interestingly enough, though, for reasons that I now can't quite establish, uh, that service never really reached any uh, significance. Hmm. So much so that I think you're, you're not even aware that uh, it, it was provided. No, I had heard that there were ideas about it, but that, yeah. as you say, it never really got off the ground to mm -hmm. any great extent. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the private public agencies then began to flourish and uh, assume much more responsibility, and so I guess mm -hmm. they took up the, the lag. Mm -hmm. I interesting uh, idea uh, is the uh, my understanding of what happened in the United States after the Vietnam War with the veterans who came back and the intensive uh, social health, psychological services which they required and which were provided. Um, in contrast, after the Second World War, Right. It'd be interesting to talk to someone who knows about that sort of thing to find out what the differences were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My guess is that uh, Canada began to uh, develop and Quebec uh, developed their own services, mm -hmm. and so they were able to pick pick up the uh, uh, services that were being provided otherwise through the army. Yeah. A further question on it that occurs to me as a result of what you've just said. To what extent was there a recognition, in your recollection, after the Second World War, that the veterans might have suffered some kind of long-term consequences from the war? I wasn't aware of any at all. Uh, I think there were two kinds of veterans. Uh, one that had to be hospitalized or institutionalized, and the others. And it was taken for granted that the others were just, would just find their own way. Well, the fact that you raise it makes it interesting uh, to think about whether there were more problems than I realize. Uh, I'm not aware of them. I certainly didn't have any of the uh, post-Vietnam kind of syndromes that uh, existed. People seem to have gone back uh, into their, uh, into the workforce and uh, with their families and those who, uh, who had the natural resources or the inner resources uh, succeeded. And I think uh, those who'd failed in the army failed in, in civilian life. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not aware of any traumatic experience or syndrome that did exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we can stop there for a moment. Sure. Okay, Mr. Batchow, we were discussing uh, your experience in the military social work. Um, the war ended in 1945. What happened to you then? I moved to the United States because I uh, felt that I wanted to broaden my experience, particularly in group work. And there was a, an organization known as the Neighborhood Center of Philadelphia, 
It was actually a settlement house, one of the early ones in South Philadelphia. And I uh, felt that uh, there I would have a much more intensive experience than what I had previously had, and I also had to sort of catch up with group work since I had uh, been working mostly in community organization and in casework in the Army setting. And uh, I spent uh, two or three years in Philadelphia at the Neighborhood Center, and it was a uh, fascinating experience because the uh, it, it represented the transition from the settlement house to the uh, modern YMCA or other type of group work agency. And as I recall it, the uh, major uh, question which uh, was raised at that time was could the settlement house worker who lived in the settlement house, who really was so much part and parcel of the community, uh, could the um, quality of the service be maintained if it moved from that to uh, the more traditional type of organization that we now have, where uh, uh, people don't live in the in the settlement house where they uh, are really carrying on their work uh, as professionals while settlement house workers really were I think uh, much more committed to uh, the service they were doing rather than their own professional development. Uh, they were acting out of heart and out of uh, social concern. Um, while the modern group of uh, social workers were people who were uh, much more interested in theory and in uh, philosophy and uh, in practice. And I would say that uh, the concern was probably not unreal because uh, there was, I think, a reduction in the focus on the neighborhood and on the community. Uh, South Philadelphia, for example, was a, uh, a depressed neighborhood. A large number of uh, Negroes who were coming in. And uh, there were all of the attendant problems. But yet the neighborhood house, while addressing themselves to it, uh, did it with much less of a focus and emphasis and intensity then I understood to have been the case at the time that it was a settlement house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a feeling that that particular characteristic uh, and trend, if you will, uh, has continued. That unfortunately our preoccupation with our profession and with our professional role has somehow diminished in my judgment, uh, the concern we have for our society. Uh, this, I think, uh, illustrates itself by the uh, limited social action uh, that certainly is uh, extant today. Uh, in the earlier days, there was much more of it uh, in the 40s and the 50s. I think we were much more concerned about uh, making representations to government and uh, in uh, marching and protest uh, and in uh, pleading the case of uh, the uh, less fortunate in the community than we are today. I think we're now doing it, but we're doing it in, in a very sophisticated way and the very sophistication in my judgment seems to lack some of the emotional component that certainly dates back to the settlement house days where we used to worry about traffic light and would do everything literally that was doable. That is that each of us could do individually and as a group to, to get changes 
uh, affected. While today, I think there's a tendency to uh, make formal re representations, to prepare briefs, and uh, it's just the, the um, I, I think that's more limiting than uh, the more uh, personal and uh, emotional component. Mm -hmm. It's true that I guess we can change laws more effectively today than we did then, but uh, if you think of it in terms of changing conditions of people and, and the conditions in which they lived, I think most of us felt that we had played a much more significant role uh, than we think social workers are playing today. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I read a statement yesterday in a um, recent publication that said that, um, or that hypothesized that um, one of the effects of the professionalization of social work has been a distancing from the survival needs of the poor. We now are concerned with the uh, emotional maladjustment of the middle class, and we've distanced ourselves from the survival needs of the poor. Would you have any comments on that statement? I would say that uh, we're still, I think, very much uh, concerned about the emotional problems of the poor, and I, I wouldn't uh, uh, ascribe the development to uh, having moved from the poor to the middle class. But uh, I do think that we've distanced ourselves from the, uh, from the poor or from people generally uh, as a group uh, because of our focus on, on people as individuals. In other words, we're deeply concerned about uh, every client today as we were in the past. I don't see any difference in the uh, concern, the emotional component there, but I don't see that uh, we are nearly as involved or concerned about uh, uh, groups of people, of uh, classes of people. Uh, I think the, the poor as a group, the, uh, uh, the, the, the children who are uh, uh, having problems, families having problems. Uh, the whole issue of family life today, which is going through such tremendous trials, uh, I don't see that we are really uh, coping with it or dealing with it. And rather, uh, we're doing a very intensive job with every family that breaks down. But we're not dealing with uh, the causes for the breakdown, and we're not dealing with the, uh, the the basic issues. And I think we tended to be much more issue oriented in the past than we are today. Mm-hmm. That's a very helpful helpful observation from someone such as yourself who's had a long experience in this. For me, as a relatively uh, person who's relatively new in the field, in ten years or so, it's an interesting observation to hear certainly food for thought for me and for the other people who will hear or read or watch this, I'm sure. Um, over the next several years, you were back and forth between Canada and the United States. Um, I don't know to what extent you want to talk about your time uh, in, when you were in Hamilton, for example. Well, it's interesting that uh, my background in uh, social work was generic in terms of, as I spoke earlier, uh, about our not making very uh, major distinctions between case work, uh, group work, uh, community organization. And my career seemed to have followed that kind of pattern as well, because uh, while I started in group work, I did my field work in case work and then worked as a case worker and uh, then went into the Army where I did a largely community organization job and uh, then out of the Army back into group work and then from group work uh, and the, um, from Philadelphia uh, 
uh, to uh, Hamilton, which was a community organization job again. And uh, so I would uh, just like to draw a conclusion that uh, there is much to be said for the generic approach, that if one really has a basic training in social work, both in terms of its philosophy and in the techniques, that uh, it speaks well for that generic approach rather than the specialized one. I just can't help but believe that uh, one really is um, much more qualified if one can uh, work in all of these different areas. Uh, it's true that I suppose uh, someone could, uh, there's much to be said for someone uh, after getting a generic education, uh, say becoming a specialist in uh, psychiatric social work because there's no question that there are some additional skills that have to be acquired for that. But I guess if I was to uh, design a course in social work today based on the experience, uh, I wouldn't have anybody uh, go into a specialization until they first got their initial degree uh, in social work generally. For me, the initial degree still is the master's, uh, even though it's now considered a bachelor's, and I guess I have some views on that too, and that is I don't really uh, uh, feel that we have made any significant progress by uh, reducing the qualification of social workers uh, in terms of receiving a bachelor's degree and going into practice. I think uh, social work requires a certain maturity, both of age and experience, which uh, not all people who graduate as bachelors uh, are prepared to assume uh, beyond the fact that uh, the uh, number of courses, the number of hours and courses, the amount of field work and so on is all reduced. and. Uh, I don't think any of us ever felt who were in the master's program that uh, uh, we wasted time or that the course was too long or it wasn't necessary. If anything, uh, the feeling was that we wish we had had more and some people obviously went on to get their doctorate degrees. So here too, I think if I had my druthers, I would not only because of Again, the romanticism of the past, but I really think uh, objectively that uh, I would return to the master's degree as the basic course, uh, basic requirement of social work, and that that master's degree, as I would see it, would 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 be a, uh, a generic one, mm -hmm. um, with person perhaps taking another year after that if they were going into a specialization. Perhaps the ideal would be for them to get a master's degree then go to work, even if it was in a psychiatric setting, and then go back to school for a year after having had some experience in the field and become a, a specialist. But uh, my own personal judgment is that uh, except for those areas like uh, medical social work where it requires the team approach, uh, that um, the generic training uh, really keeps one in good stead in terms of being able to function in the various requirements of social work, whether it be casework, group work, or community organization. Mm -hmm. So that when I came back uh, uh, from the United States, that is from Philadelphia, I moved into a community organization set up where the uh, Hamilton, which was a small Jewish community of only some 3,000 Jewish people, where uh, Hamilton was in the position of uh, organizing its various services uh, for that community. And uh, they even went beyond the uh, traditional social work services of casework and group work. Uh, but included uh, Jewish education, uh, included uh, uh, 
raising of funds for Israel, and um, in, in many ways uh, represented uh, a community family which pr provided for its various needs. And uh, as the executive director of that organization, uh, we developed uh, our own uh, social planning uh, in uh, determining uh, what type of Jewish education programs were needed in the future, what kind of uh, recreation programs were required. And this led to the construction of a new building, uh, which still exists. And, um, Within that building, we had all activities from uh, uh, a day center for working mothers, uh, preschool programs, uh, all kinds of recreation for all age groups, including the geriatric or aged group, and um, as well as the Jewish educational services, the fundraising services. Uh, we organized uh, a council of organizations, which actually was like the board of directors of the community. And uh, they were the ones who did the planning, they were the ones who assumed the responsibilities, engaged the staff, and so on. So that was a uh, remarkably good experience for, for a social worker. And again, I would heartily recommend uh, the experience in a small community for a social worker because mm -hmm. you are confronted with and frankly given an opportunity to function in so many other areas than you would otherwise be able to do if you were working in a large city in a single agency. You're relatively isolated while here you're exposed to everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, if I, I could uh, encourage people to work in smaller communities I just think it's, it's probably uh, among the best training experiences one can have. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you a couple questions about your work um, <clears throat> during that period of time. Um, you came back to Hamilton, I think, in what, 1948, I guess it was. And uh, during that period of time, um, uh, I would imagine, or uh, I don't remember, but I would imagine that. Uh, uh, the people who had been uh, the victims of the persecution in Europe were coming to Canada during that time. Were you, was your organization involved in settlement yes. and resettlement efforts? Yes, indeed. Uh, this was a uh, very, very difficult uh, period in that uh, immigrants were coming here we wish that they had come in much larger numbers. I don't know whether you're familiar with the uh, book that's recently been, pub been published called uh, None is Too Many. I've heard of it. But it uh, literally documents what I consider to be among the shabbiest uh, experiences of our Canadian government in terms of uh, I guess, crass discrimination in uh, preventing Jewish refugees from coming here during the course of the war. And even afterwards, it wasn't until the 50s that uh, there was a change in attitude. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, some refugees did get here. And uh, they got here largely uh, not from Europe, but uh, via China and uh, via South America, via Israel, because uh, the European quota was, was closed, or practically closed. And uh, no Jews were too many in terms of the government's official attitude. So, uh, what we were able to do, though, and which represented a major program at that time, was that uh, the government did allow a thousand uh, refugee children 
come. And uh, these children were uh, settled in various communities in various cities throughout Canada, mostly in Montreal and Toronto, some in, uh, in Hamilton. And uh, I, I must say just editorially that uh, some of our outstanding citizens in Canada, and certainly in the Jewish community, were, are among those refugee children. Uh, so they were really a great asset. And uh, so our, part of our task uh, at that time was to find homes for these children, which were readily available, and uh, to uh, settle them. Uh, some, you were made re reference to trauma before um, in relation to soldiers, but uh, I recall the trauma that some of the children experienced in being separated from their families. Um, in most cases, they didn't know what happened to their parents because they were probably exterminated. And um, in Hamilton, that happens uh, that probably the most traumatic experience I've had in my career occurred because uh, I had a young man who was about 14, I think, who uh, required surgery and, uh, and he didn't want the surgery because he was just so frightened by it and uh, we uh, determined that uh, medically that uh, a doctor in Toronto would be even more skilled at this particular type of surgery it's internal and uh, so we, I guess, forced him to go to Toronto. Uh, a, he didn't want the operation, and B, I think his going to Toronto must have been terribly difficult for him because, again, he was being pulled away from the one community that he did begin to have a little bit of contact with. And uh, this, this boy, underwent the surgery and never recovered from it. That is, he uh, developed high temperatures afterwards. Uh, I don't think anybody was able, as far as I know, to medically determine what happened. I'm almost convinced, and was convinced at the time, that the, his psychological anxiety uh, was probably the largest factor because he died within hours and the uh, doctor was as surprised as anybody. And uh, so it caused me at least uh, to give thought to the effect of psychological uh, attitudes towards health and illness. And, uh, of course, at that time, I was very self-blaming because uh, I wasn't sure that. Well, certainly, he wouldn't have been better. He wouldn't have been worse off if he hadn't had the operation. He would have mm -hmm. perhaps died anyway, but at least I wouldn't have been party to it. And, and uh, secondly, moving him to Toronto. But I'm sure there were other such kinds of problems that uh, children experience. But for the most part. As I say, they are just uh, some of our most successful Jewish citizens. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Another question about that period of time. Um, you mentioned uh, in response to my last question about the, uh, the discrimination of the Canadian government against the Jews. What was it like in Hamilton at the time? Not, in, not to single out Hamilton, except that that's where you were, but to what extent was discrimination a factor in Jewish life in Canada? Uh, it wasn't a, uh, a factor, and when I talk about the discrimination uh, by government, it obviously wasn't government policy to discriminate, but there were government officials who actually, uh, under Mackenzie King, uh, 
we're given just complete uh, authority to act and uh, there's no question in my mind that these officials, these bureaucrats, uh, these ministers were anti-Semitic. But uh, it didn't reflect itself in terms of uh, how it affected the average citizen other than uh, you know, at McGill, for example, when required higher marks uh, to get into it, into McGill if you were a Jew than if you were a non-Jew. I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but uh, certainly in the late uh, 40s, uh, we found that uh, if, uh, not found, but we experienced, even in my day, uh, if you were a uh, a Jew, you required a minimum of, I think it was 75% in, in uh, the matriculation exams in, out of high school. Uh, if you were a non-Jew, you could get in with 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had that kind of discrimination. There was also uh, in Quebec at that time uh, a very nationalistic organization led by ARCOM uh, and the St. Jean Baptiste Society which issued all kinds of uh, discriminatory or anti-Semitic uh, statements but it didn't affect us in Hamilton or in any other part of Canada in terms of our daily lives. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you uh, went uh, again to the United States and you were in Atlanta, Georgia for some years and then to New York, New, New Jersey. New Jersey and then New York. And then New York. Um, bec because uh, of our Canadian content here, um, if you put that on the hook on the silver part there instead of the black, it'll probably stay in better. That seems to be all right. Okay. Um, and because of the uh, limitations of time today, uh, the questions that I would ask you about your American experience for the next uh, number of years are not to limit your um, the importance of that in your life, but to try and help us understand what was happening in Canada. Uh, and regarding your career. During the time that you were in the States, which was from this time, from 1951 to 1968, it was a period of tremendous upheaval and change in the United States regarding things like integration of the blacks, um, equal opportunity, um, uh, the war on poverty, um, a number of things, were civil rights, prejudice was rampant, the, the McCarthy hearings were going on at the time. How did that feel as a Canadian with the background that you had had, uh, with your father and mother active in charitable and political activities? What was that like for you as a Canadian to be in those situations at that time and as a social worker? I think that uh, if one uh, is uh, one who sort of stands on the sidelines and observes these things. Uh, I suppose one can uh, distance oneself from them and look at them objectively. But uh, I will say that to the extent that um, I recall, both within the Jewish community and in the social work community, generally, there was uh, a sense of almost intimacy in relation to these various events. Uh, one didn't uh, think of them objectively and uh, as being a part of history. One was really living through them. And, uh, While I wish I could recall even more uh, 
active participation and involvement, uh, I would say that a record of uh, our social work conferences throughout that period uh, was replete with these social concerns rather than the professional concerns. I think the psychological emphasis uh, came at a later period, in a more modern period, more recent period. But at that time, I think we were very much absorbed in uh, the problems. Uh, the whole business ref with reference to civil rights, for example, there were many social workers, and particularly Jewish social workers, who I was familiar with, even more than others, but other social workers as well, who were among those who went to Birmingham and who uh, uh, were uh, concerned about the problems, not uh, theoretically and philosophically, but really in terms of, of being very personally involved. And uh, I think that that was the same way in which we, we reacted to the McCarthy era. Um, that was not seen, for example, even by the Jewish group as being a Jewish concern, but it was a universal concern. And uh, uh, whether it was uh, contributing funds or uh, whether it was uh, protesting uh, through organizations, through writing. Uh, I think the whole business of letters to the editor is, is an art which social workers have lost, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many more people who seem to express themselves publicly at that time than uh, perhaps today. And uh, in general, I would just say that I think our involvement was much more personal. And it perhaps fits into the whole uh, interview we're having because uh, I think I implied that at least I sense that we have moved away from the, the personal involvement to, quote, the professional involvement. And we've almost made a religion out of the objectivity of our profession and the sophistication of our skills, uh, and I suppose if I was to offer an analogy, it would be uh, the cabinet maker who is so concerned about his chisels and, and how he cuts, uh, rather than uh, being as concerned as the cabinet maker used to be about the result the cabinet that he was creating. I'm not sure that we are nearly as concerned about creating the society that we believe in uh, and that we're prevented from doing it by our preoccupation with the, the minutia, with the detail of our profession. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can't do both, but uh, I sense that the more we specialize, the more we uh, intensify our concentration on skill and in refining the skill, that somehow we maybe are uh, moving away from appreciating fully the, uh, what the skill is all about or what the end result of the skill is. It's interesting that you would make that <coughs> excuse me that comment. Um, I recently finished reading an autobiography of Bertha Reynolds from the United States, and she talked in her concluding chapter about the sense of mission that had guided her throughout her long career. She mentioned the extent to which that sense of mission she felt alienated her from others in her profession and from clients. And the conclusion that she came to near the end of the book, and perhaps near the end of her life, was that what overrode the sense of mission and the skills and the expertise with which she used those skills 
was a sense of relatedness to the clients, to her colleagues, and to what was happening in society. And she, like you, I think, felt that, that the loss or the absence of that sense of relatedness led to the diminution of the profession. Well, I think that that's a sound conclusion in my judgment. And you see it happening, I think, more and more. You take the whole development of uh, the corporation of social workers in, in the province of Quebec. Uh, you, either because of the numbers uh, of social workers, in other words, we're a much larger group than we've ever been, or because we are so dispersed uh, in public agencies and so involved in public agencies with the kind of anonymity that that uh, tends to encourage you find that so many social workers don't know each other anymore and uh, really don't feel related to each other. And if you don't feel related to each other, then how can you relate yourself to a profession? And, and I sense, at any rate, that uh, the relationship to uh, the profession is, is a, um, a formal one. It's, you know, like a doctor requires uh, <clears throat> membership in the medical association in order to practice, well, now you require membership in the corporation if you're going to practice. The, even the word corporation, while it probably has French origin, it really implies bureaucracy rather than the word association, which was always the way we described ourselves, uh, which you know, self-evident of the difference between the two words. Mm -hmm. I think that it also reflects the difference in attitudes. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, when you decided to return to Canada in 1968, I guess it was, um, I, I, I was thinking about the contrast, or I'm not sure what it was contrast, as I mentioned earlier, uh, between what was happening in the States at the time you left and what was happening in Canada at the time you came back. Well, 1968 in Montreal was a time of violence, nationalism, growing nationalism. Um, shortly after you arrived back, the October crisis occurred and the War Measures Act was imposed. You had left the United States at a time of the Vietnam War protests and, and uh, a number of other social action kinds of activities. Um, what was it like when you came back to Montreal in 1968? Mm -hmm. I don't know what your own experience uh, has been, but uh, while I'd like to believe that uh, Canada is unique uh, as a country, uh, I can't help but also uh, realize that we really are part of North America, and what happens in the United States is so influential on what happens in Canada. Our Canadian dollar is affected by what happens to the American dollar. And almost any uh, social event will develop nationalism, uh, I think, is, is one that uh, you can't really distinguish between Canada and the United States. Many people feel, and we certainly realize this in the Jewish community, that um, Canada is usually one generation behind the United States in its social development. And for example, well, if we were to take the subject of intermarriage, uh, we would find that uh, intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews uh, in the United States uh, was much higher, has always been much higher than in Canada. But interestingly enough, uh, the experience now is that uh, we're not very much further behind. In other words, we're catching up. And uh, because we are still basically an, an immigrant community, and that many of us still have parents or grandparents who were uh, immigrants, uh, in Canada, that's, that's the case in Canada, more than the United States. We're second generation, third generation Jews. In the United States, they're fourth and fifth generation Jews. Uh, 
and the difference just seems to be that generational period. So I think that that is a generalization I think I would also make with reference to, the, to Canada the United States generally, that uh, we are unfortunately uh, more and more like the United States. And uh, the only thing is that it, we're a little bit behind uh, and that uh, it takes a little, little longer. So that when I came back from the United States to Canada, it wasn't like I was coming to a foreign, or coming from a foreign country to home. Uh, home was not terribly different than the foreign country. Uh, so that uh, I, I can't recall that, um, you know, there were any kind of shocks that I experienced. Uh, certainly the October crises was a terrible shock for everyone. But I can't think that it was even more so than for me than for someone else. So that uh, I, I really would, I'm suggesting that I think Canada is a little bit of the United States only not yet uh, it hadn't quite reached that stage mm -hmm. but, um, but it was very it's very much like it and I think that's it's equally true today mm -hmm. I don't think we have a Canadian Canadian identity I wish we did yes I, I wish I could tell you that it was very different coming back home actually I was thinking of the similarities yeah, yeah. Um, but it was because of the political events that were going on in both countries at the time, rather than any sense of Canadian or American identity for that. Right. Could you uh, tell us about what you were doing when you came back? What, what was the job that you came to and right. what it was like, and the agency especially? Well, Montreal uh, is the largest, or was the largest, I'm hesitating because up until recently it was the largest had the largest Jewish community in Canada. Uh, Toronto now has. Um, and, uh, psychologically, it causes me to uh, to hesitate uh, in, in acknowledging that. But uh, it was the largest uh, Jewish community, and without question, was and still is. Uh, I think the most uh, highly developed uh, community in terms of uh, social services within the Jewish community and its relationship to the general community. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was invited to uh, come back to Canada to accept the position of uh, executive vice president of the Allied Jewish Community Services. Uh, it's the organization which is the central uh, body that provides all the health, education, and welfare services to the community, to the Jewish community. Uh, it has uh, two major functions. One is uh, social planning and the provision of these services like child care and various hospitals, uh, summer camps, YMHA, uh, student activities, uh, educational activities, and so on. Uh, very much like the microcosm we had in Hamilton, only instead of for 3,000 Jewish people, I was serving 115,000 Jewish people in Montreal. And uh, so one uh, major function uh, is the planning and the provision of services to the community. And uh, the other is to raise the funds within the Jewish community for these local services, as well as for supporting services in Israel. So that, uh, in effect, each year uh, we conducted a campaign among all the Jewish residents and raised millions of dollars each year, half of which approximately remain here for our local services and the other half was provided for services largely in Israel but in other parts of the world as well where there were Jews who were in need. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> this um, uh, was a very uh, professional agency, had a large staff, and had uh, 20 constituent health education and welfare agencies, all of which were professionally staffed. And uh, I would like to believe that the services that we have in this community are uh, you know, among the best in Canada, if not in North America. A major problem that the Jewish community experienced um, was the development in Quebec of public services, and uh, particularly the Castonguay report, uh, and I think it was in 1965 that um, the recommendation was made that there be a public services developed uh, in the form of these uh, social service centers. Um, and uh, it took a number of years to develop, but uh, for the Jewish community it had special problems because we had had a history of providing our own services to the Jewish people. So we had our own Jewish family service agency. We had our own uh, Jewish institutions of all kinds. And uh, yet there was this pressure on the part of government to uh, universalize all services. And uh, this uh, required considerable effort on a community organization standpoint in dealing with the community and determining how they feel about it. And it's a very, very strong feeling that we must have our own services, even if it meant rejecting government services, and even if it meant our having to pay for these services ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there were the negotiations with government to help them understand that uh, you just couldn't universalize it. And this led to the uh, three services, namely the French and the uh, English and the Jewish. So we have three networks. What's interesting to me now is that well, that conclusion of having the three networks was, it was decided sometime, I think, in the late 60s, and perhaps, what, about 15 years ago. There is now the same pressure to do away with the networks and to have just one government network uh, to serve the entire population. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a very serious and important uh, development which will require again a major community organization uh, efforts both within the community and in the negotiations of the community with the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. During the time that you were <clears throat> with Allied uh, Jewish Community Services, your position as Executive Vice President, it, was that at, like Executive Director? Yes, right. It, it actually started as executive director, and then uh, there was a, a promotion in title, anyway, to executive vice president, but it really didn't change the function uh -huh. at all. Uh -huh. um, I heard a comment in, a, in an interview that I did recently from an English-speaking um, Quebecer that social services in the Jewish community have always led, uh, as far as quality, always led the field, not only in Montreal, but across the country. Um, to what would you attribute that? Uh? I, I think it's attributable to uh, the story I told you about my mother and father. And um, the reason that they were uh, so uh, concerned about the welfare of others and felt the need to personally participate uh, is something that they just didn't acquire when they came to Canada. But this was something that, uh, that they learned at the knee of their parents, and that their parents learned at the knee of their 
parents. And it, I suppose, dates back to the religious background, uh, the whole sense of uh, ethics and morality. Uh, our religion, for example, uh, teaches us that um, the dignity of the individual is of the highest possible regard. So if Jewish social workers were concerned about retaining the right uh, of a welfare recipient to, to own his car or to have a bank account, as I recalled earlier, it again wasn't just pulled out of the air, but it uh, had its origin in terms of uh, uh, what we were actually taught religiously. and. Uh, Perhaps the greatest, uh, we call it mitzvah, but the greatest deed of importance that a person can achieve is, is to welcome the stranger and uh, to serve the poor and to share with him. Well, I'm not saying that the Jews are, uh, you know, the epitome of, uh, of ethical people, but if you were to ask, you know, what the origin for and the explanation for the quality of our services is we've been doing it for several thousands of years. I've frequently been asked uh, this question by Sant Red, which is like the United Fund, as to why it is that in Montreal the Jewish community raises nearly, it used to be twice as much, but raises at least a hundred percent more than Saint Red, and yet we're a community of 110,000 while the general population is uh, around three million. So how can 110,000 people raise as much or more than uh, Saint Red? And, you know, without being facetious, I, I, I meant it when I frequently replied that uh, know, when the general population will have had as much experience as the Jewish population has had in terms of years of experience and life experiences, then uh, there will be a, a sense of uh, responsibility, <coughs> which uh, without question is, is much more, uh, much deeper in the Jewish community than the general community. I think we feel much more deeply about uh, civil rights. Uh, we feel much more deeply about uh, poverty. Uh, we feel much more deeply about uh, just our fellow man. Uh, but it's because of a religious background. It's because of uh, long, long years of, uh, of experience, mm -hmm. which leads us to this conclusion. Mm -hmm. I know my, my grandson was uh, six uh, last week went uh, on a march uh, to raise funds for a charitable cause. Uh, I'm not sure he knows entirely what he was raising the money for, but he knew, knew it was for charity. And, uh, and he'll be doing that the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that it's to be expected then that uh, he would, uh, at a, an adult age, be interested in uh, serving on a board of directors uh, of an agency. And if he did, then he'd be talking about experience he's had uh, for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, as in contrast, and this is not to say that others don't have that experience, but we're talking about the percentage and the intensity of the experience uh, in contrast to, uh, I think, uh, the average youngster who is uh, perhaps not exposed to quite as much as that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just a matter of degree of exposure, <coughs> degree of experience, degree of intensity that causes us, I think, to uh, feel that we uh, also I think part of our tradition is excellence, mm -hmm. and therefore I think the feeling of uh, that 
we're going to have agencies, so they've got to be excellent agencies. That, I, I, uh, yeah. I, I think I'm exaggerating, but uh, because I, I think one can't generalize, we have plenty of people who uh, have not had, uh, who've not come out of the experience as, as noble people as I may be representing <laughs> uh, or describing. Uh, uh, so that uh, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt, but the, uh, mainly I think the point that I was trying to make was that uh, it's had a long origin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the comment that you make about uh, excellence and the search for excellence in your, in your services and, and what you're providing uh, leads me to ask about the uh, commissions that you served on uh, during the time that you were executive vice president of the agency. Well, in 1975, <coughs> There was a, uh, a serious uh, problem in Montreal in that uh, one of the uh, newspaper reporters, uh, name I think was Cosgroves, who worked for the uh, Montreal Star at the time, or the Gazette, I think it was the, no, I guess it was the Gazette. Uh, she had heard uh, that one of the uh, institutions, French-speaking institution, uh, in Montreal called Notre Dame de la Merci, uh, was maltreating children. And uh, she got herself a job in the uh, institution and worked there for two weeks as a child care worker. And uh, during that time, she was uh, able to get a lot of evidence of of the problems, and then wrote, uh, she left the institution and wrote a series of, uh, I think it was three or four full page articles with artist drawing illustrations, uh, which would have very well uh, described the uh, uh, Middle Ages and the treatment of children at that time. and. Uh, it was uh, so uh, serious that um, it caused a public outcry in the city and the government was under severe attack to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a casual acquaintance with uh, uh, Claude Forget, who was the Minister of Social Affairs through my work at the Allied Jewish Community Services. And uh, I called him, it was just before Christmas, and uh, I said, uh, this is a very serious problem based on what's being written, but it's, it's doubly serious for you. Because, A, if it's true, then by golly, something's got to be done about it. And if it's not completely true, then why should you be taking all of this flat? this flack. And uh, so he, he thought about it and uh, I was really urging him for action. And he says, what do you think we ought to do about it? And I said, well, I would be prepared to put together, this was a Friday afternoon, put together a uh, group of social workers uh, to go into the institution. We lived there for a couple of days over the weekend and uh, talk to everybody who possibly could. And um, we'll try to have a report for you on Monday morning. Mm. And, uh, <coughs> Can you stop for sure. a minute, please? Change the videotape, too.